Throughout the ages, history has been altered by word of mouth and the misrepresentation of those who might not have been present when some of the world's most significant events took place. Channelers Barry and Connie Strom bring through the spirits of those who actually witnessed or took part in these historical events and lets them tell their stories in their own words. Welcome to Channeling History, and now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strong. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to Channeling History. We're the only show where we speak to the souls that made things happen, and we're brought to you on the Parrax Radio Network. I'm Barry Strom, your host, and I'll be doing the channeling tonight. I'm Connie Strom, your co-host. Tonight, we'll be speaking with three great authors whose writings foretold the future. We will speak with George Orwell, the author of the novel that predicted a society controlled by Big Brother, where everything was controlled. John Steinbeck wrote books that spoke of social issues in the United States. And Jules Verne, the father of social science fiction, wrote of a future with many predictions that have come true. We will not be taking a break this evening so that we can spend as much time as possible channeling our guests. I will be asking the questions of our spirit guests tonight, as usual. All of our shows are available on our YouTube channel in Barry's name, or if you'd like to download them, just go to Podomatic.com and search Channeling History. Please tell your friends about us so we can continue to grow our audience. Okay, now we always give a small disclaimer, because we have no idea what our spirit guests are going to say. So the opinions or statements voiced on our show or the channeled words of the spirits do not necessarily reflect our opinions, those of the Parax Network, or of our sponsors. Also, before we channel, we all say a prayer of protection. So Connie's going to say the prayer, and we will begin to channel with our three great guests tonight. God, please grant us your wisdom and protection. Grant us the knowledge that we can handle and keep us safe from all things that will harm us. Keep the messages positive and pure love. Keep us safe from our egos. We ask these things in the light of the seen, the unseen, and the honesty of God. Amen. All right, Connie. I've been looking forward to the show tonight, so let's get her started. Okay. First up will be George Orwell. Thank you so much, George, for joining us this evening. You considered yourself a democratic socialist. Would you define democratic socialism for us? Yes. First of all, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to come through. As you know, it's very difficult to speak from this side. So... Thank you so much. You are quite welcome. We need to hear from you. Democratic socialism, I believe, was a, was a combination of the best circumstances for both socialism and for democracy. We all know, or I knew, that pure socialism would never work. You run out of other people's money. Many individuals are lazy. There are just many problems to it. In a democracy, the strongest thing is your elections. You have people that are in charge that are elected. So in a social democracy, you would have many of the social programs, many of the things such as free medical care, a safety net, unemployment, many of the social programs that are needed for a society to exist. But by combining it with a democracy, you elect your leaders, you have checks and balances on those leaders. So in theory, that would provide, in my mind, the best type of government. However, we are seeing many problems with democracy today, so I'm a little unsure as to what truly is the best at this point. As you watch from the other side, what do you think of democratic socialism today? Probably the best example of democratic socialism today takes place in the European Union. There are many problems. They are, I think, trying to do too many social programs, with all of the countries involved, 
it's very difficult to get a fair representation. There are many cultures in the European Union, and we have seen that as the European Union progresses, that it becomes more, shall we say, totalitarian. It is ruled by the larger countries. It is becoming a political system with many of the problems that are associated with many of the more restrictive government types. In your book, Animal Farm, you tell the story of a group of farm animals that rebel against their human farmer, hoping to create a society where animals can be free, equal, and happy. The story reflects the events leading up to the Russian Revolution of 1917 and into the Stalinist area of the Soviet Union. Why were you so critical of the Soviet Union at that particular time? I thought that as I watched, that there was actually going to be hope for the Russian people. The czars had basically kept the people as as slaves. There were many, many problems with the government. I thought that if the people truly took over and had a combination of socialism, democracy, Marx wrote of his communism, I thought that they might truly be hope for the Soviet people. However, Stalin turned out to be a total dictator. He was cruel, brutal. Millions of people were killed. I thought that my book gave a very good portrayal of the realities what took place in the Soviet Union. Yes. Uh, What form of government do you now consider having the highest possibility of success? I think a, a socialized democracy in which the democratic part of it has more control than the socialized part. All societies need social nets, but they also need people to be able to better themselves, to advance. They need their politicians to be controlled by the majority. I think that there need to be stronger controls and guarantees of free speech, freedom of religion, many of the things in the United States Constitution that are currently being taken away from the people. I think a type of government with inclusive social nets, and in my mind that also includes medical care, but a fair society or political system where the politicians are truly controlled by the people. I am not sure this type of government can ever last for long because of the greed of people. They try to take over power, money. As you can see, it's happening today. Do you see the rebirth of Stalinism in the current Putin government? Absolutely. My heart bleeds for the Russian people. They've been lied to for so long that they do not know truth from fiction. Instead of the government under Putin doing what they could for the people, improving their way of lives, creating true social nets, roads, all of the things that people need to grow and to advance, a minority of the politicians stole the most of the money from the taxpayers. The people have been abused for so long that they allowed it to happen. So yes, actually I do see a rebirth of Stalinism in the way that Putin and his friends are are controlling Russians. Do you see any way out for the poor Russian people? Oh, it's going to be very, very difficult. They've been abused and lied to for hundreds of years. I think, sadly, the only way out is for a type of revolution. I think that the decisions that they're making with the current war is going to destroy the government. I think the opportunity will be there. Sadly, 
the common person will have very little power if they truly unite and elect people that that do have their best interests at heart, they may have a chance. Let's hope. You wrote the book during World War II when Stalin was an ally of Great Britain. How was that book received? Well, it would not want let me truly print the truth about Stalin. I had trouble getting a publisher for it. I was right. They were wrong. And it was not until after the war that they realized it. Okay, your final book, 1984, speaks of totalitarian, totalitarian <laughs> super states where Big Brother rules through brutality and propaganda. It seems as though many of your predictions are coming true. Did you have some way of predicting the future? I didn't realize it, but I did. I would be getting these ideas. They would come to me in dreams. Sometimes when I would meditate and find a quiet place, these ideas would come. I didn't truly realize it, but the guides and spirits were trying to lead me towards warning the people of the dangers that were to come. I didn't realize it, but yes, I did I did have a lot of guidance from the other side. When I returned, I truly did understand what was taking place, and my life plan was prepared that I would try to warn people of the possibilities of the future. George, who do you consider the modern big brother? Well, right now there are several of them. Uh, obviously, Putin in Russia. He is, uh, I would think, one of the most difficult individuals to live under. China, the leaders of China have always dictated what all the people would learn and what they would, the information that they would have. Right now, Iran, the leaders over there are trying, but the people are much more intelligent, I think, in Iran. They have had freedoms in the recent past. So they're, they're the Taliban are certainly totally dictatorial. So there are, there are many out there right now. I would have problems picking the true one. Understandable. Were you aware of having any psychic abilities when you were writing these books? I didn't understand that I was having psychic abilities, but I would receive messages and I would I would I would see things. My dreams would be very very vivid. So yes, I had them, but I never realized it until I came back on this side. So now that you're on the other side, you see that your spirit guides were there helping you with, with your writings all along? Absolutely. They were giving me this information. It was, it was no accident that I came up with some of these ideas. The, the spirits wanted people to be warned of the dangers that, were, that modern societies were going to bring them. In actuality, many of the things that are taking place have happened throughout history. It is change that people need and a true understanding of what has taken place before them. As you watch from the other side, what countries do you see as coming the closest to fulfilling your predicted governmental state of 1984? Well, right now, Russia, I think, is the closest, but China is very, it's not far behind. <clears throat> the combination of those two governments would make it very, very difficult for individuals to have political freedoms and choices. Do you see any hope for those countries? I actually see see hope for the, for both of those countries, but it will take interaction of the other countries of the world. The people that live in those countries have to be aware. They have to be understand that there are opportunities out there, and they have to believe in themselves. The Chinese people have been living under dictators all of their lives. They don't see 
the truth in news. The Russians don't know what's taking place around them. I think if the free countries would make it in their interest to bring the truth to these individuals living in these countries, then I think there would be a chance for revolution and change to take place. Where do you see the United States in heading towards the governmental status predicted in 1984? Sadly, I think they're moving very rapidly towards it. Many of your so-called politicians are looking for power, strength. They want to control the people. They want to basically bring a one-party system. And you're seeing political parties controlling the news. Your constitution gave freedom of speech, and that was meant that the news agencies would bring the truth out. Much much of the truth is being hidden from the American people, and if they don't wake up, they will become very similar to the Russian people. Do you think there's any hope for the United States? Absolutely, but the people have to wake up. They have to understand what is taking place, and they have to act accordingly. Thank you so much, George, for joining us this evening. Do you have a final message for our listeners? Yes, I do. God blessed me with my writing abilities, and I did write a book. And many people read the book and took heed of the possibilities of what the future could hold for them. Sadly, many of my predictions are true. Many of them are coming true. I thought when I was was writing my book that it was fiction. I thought that it was a different way of looking at the future. I knew that Stalinist Russia had established a big brother system. I knew that there was much to be worried about in the future. I hope that people will listen. I hope people will understand that there's much evil out there. And I truly hope that people will react. They have to vote and they put have to elect politicians that truly have their best their best wishes at heart. Humans want to be free. Given the opportunity, I think that they will join together and they will do what is right. However, throughout history this has not been the case. Today, technologies can allow people to join together. They can form political parties. They can force the truth to be disclosed. So, hopefully, technology will be your answer. Hopefully, people's belief in God will help, will will guide them, and will show them the way. So, thank you very much for allowing me to come through tonight. I thoroughly appreciate it. Goodbye. And thank you again. Thank you. We also appreciate you. Our next guest is John Steinbeck. Uh, John, you were raised in the Episcopal Church, but later became agnostic. Why did you change your beliefs? The Episcopal Church, I thought, taught many things that were not accurate. The Episcopal Church was an institution. I thought that they taught many things that absolutely could not be true. I questioned many things that were in the Gospels. The Church told us that all of those words in the Gospels were accurate and were not to be changed. I didn't, I was unsure because of their teachings, whether there truly was a God. I felt that there was. I looked around and I believed that there had to be God, some influence that did all these things. But then I looked at some of the writings and I felt that there was no way they could be true. So I must admit that my belief in God diminished. And 
there were times that I truly doubted the existence of God. Religious views played an important role in your books. Was this counter to your beliefs? There was always a yin and a yang. When I would not believe, there were things telling me I should believe. So I used religious views in my writings. I was trying to portray life as it was. Many of the people had total faith. Many of the people, when things were would go bad for them, would turn to God. And I wanted to portray this reliance in my books. I knew that the majority of people, when I was, especially during the Depression, many were turning to God in hope for a better life. It didn't seem like that better life was coming. It was sadly not until the Second World War that the economy really improved. I guess my beliefs would would change. I think of, I can honestly say that there were, were very little times in my life where I didn't truly believe in God, but there were also more times that I needed to be convinced. How did being an agnostic affect your writing? Agnosticism is a neutrality. You don't believe in God, but you you don't know whether he exists or not. You try to convince yourself that he does because you know that that is the way things should be for you. He he does truly exist. I can tell you that now that I'm over here with no doubt. But I think that agnosticism on my part brought more of a neutrality into my writing. What were your views on communism? I felt that many of the viewpoints of Karl Marx were very accurate. I felt that there that there has never been a true test of communism. What you're seeing what you see in the Soviet Union is totalitarianism, it's Stalinism. A true in a, a true communism, I believe, was more of a utopian world. I know now that communism will never work. I know that human nature is is counter to communism. But at the time, things were so bad in the United States, and there was an active communist party during the 1930s in the United States. So I must admit that I was more open to communism, but I know now that I'm on the other side, it can never work. Why did you support the Soviet invasion of Finland? That was truly a mistake on my part. I felt that the Soviets were trying to maintain strong borders. I don't, I truly did not understand what was taking place. The Soviets were lying about the conditions, and I fell for some of it. And as I said, my agnostic beliefs were supporting a neutrality, and sometimes I would, I would believe more of the communist socialist, socialist line than I should have. How did the Great Depression affect your writings? Immensely. I was watching how the farmers had destroyed the land in the Dust Bowl. I watched these wonderful people trying to make a living. There was bread lines. There were people that couldn't feed their families. There were children starving. Families were breaking up because of it. It was an absolutely terrible time, and I was living as part of it. 
I tried to reflect what was taking place in the United States in my writing. You wrote about the plight of migrant workers. How would you compare their plight during your lifetime with current times? Economic times were worse during my lifetime than they are now. There are many, many poor migrants. There are many people living in countries where they are facing situations similar to what our country faced in the Great Depression. Migrants, migrants are humans. If God truly wants us to help others, and he does, then we're basically obligated to help migrants. Now, that's not saying that they should be allowed to come in without any restriction. Migrants should be able to earn a living. They should, put not, they should not put an economic burden on the United States. The United States has limited assets. Many people will not accept that as a fact. They have a limited number of jobs available. Migrants put strain on employment for citizens. But migrants do jobs that many citizens don't want to do. I think that you have to look optimistically at, at migrants. You have to consider that they can be an asset, a huge asset. But they also are not native members of the country. And a political system owes its first allegiance to the citizens of its country. It's a very, very difficult situation. Indeed. We're seeing migrants enter the country at a rate unseen in the past. What impact do you see this increased rate of migration having on the country? As I said, uncontrolled immigration can destroy a country. Immigration does have to be limited. You have to take into consideration the jobs, availability, housing, cost of housing. Will these people put great economic burdens on the country? This is taking place at a time of great inflation, of high housing values. It's very difficult for citizens to afford to live in this country. So individuals entering the country illegally are theoretically going to have more problems than the citizens of the country to get along. So they, there has to be checks and balances. Somebody has got to realize what is best for the country. Your final novel, The Winner of Our Discontent, examines moral decline in the United States. How would you compare the moral decline you witnessed with what's taking place today? There, I witnessed great moral decline. I saw the Vietnam War, World War II. Many things were taking place. But the people of those generations generally had a very strong moral background. While there was were many politicians that were taking advantage, there were still many people that were turning to the teachings of God. Churches were much stronger. Today, technology has helped destroy many or much of the moral background of the country. It is a very, very difficult time. But I'm also seeing it as a possible time of, re of rebirth of moral values. When times are bad, people turn to God. And times are very difficult. You have a major war. You have inflation. You have people that would like to destroy your country. 
you have many countries that hate the United States. So hopefully it'll be a time of rebuilding. What was your opinion of the Vietnam War? I was in favor of the Vietnam War because I felt it was, was stopping the growth of communisms. I knew the communism was terrible, the way that it was being practiced, and I thought it needed to be stopped. Now that I'm on the other side, I understand that it was a very, very difficult situation, and the Vietnam War wound up creating great controversy in the United States. Yes. What was your opinion of J. Edgar Hoover? J. Edgar Hoover thought that I was a communist. He investigated me. He could find nothing wrong. He had me, he had my tax return investigated every year. He was a, a terrible individual. Did you have any way of foreseeing the future? I would have vivid dreams. I would, I would see things in my dreams, but not to the extent that I had this great outlook to the future. I was more occupied with what was taking place around me. As I said, the depression, wars, I lived in a very, very difficult time. So I don't think that I really was had a great knack for seeing the future. I think that I was sent, well, I know that I was sent back to make the American people aware of what was taking place in their culture. Did you have any psychic abilities at all? If I did, they were very minor. When you arrived on the other side, did you find your guides were assisting you with the writing concepts? Yes, I was very surprised to see that I had had a lot of help when I was on, on the life side. I didn't understand the concept of life plans, but I was sent back with a life plan to help change the way people looked at the human civilization and to understand that it was morally degenerating. Okay. Of Mice and Men is one of the books most heavily banned in the United States. Why do you think schools want to ban your book? Right now we have people that cannot stand the truth. The United States today is being faced with more propaganda, I think, than at any other time in their past. Perhaps the Civil War time was more with both sides saying what they wanted. But right now you're seeing the opposite of freedom of speech and press. I wrote Mice of Mice and Men for a reason. I wanted the average person to understand what was taking place in the American culture. Yes, I may have used profanity. I may have used ways of writing that individuals don't totally approve of. But I was trying to accomplish something. The fact that they banned my book is in violation of the concepts upon which the United States was born. Of Mice and Men tells a story. It tells a story that individuals should take to heart. When schools decide what the minds of their students should focus on, then the schools are not performing their role. Students need to hear all the different opinions. They need to make their own decisions. They do not need to be forced into the opinions of the individuals running the schools. What is your opinion of capitalism today? Capitalism today is not true capitalism. Your economy is almost totally guided by regulations and rules. The Fed 
controls the printing of money. The printing of money controls inflation. When they order the printing of money without consideration of debt, then inflation rules. Inflation destroys the middle class. It destroys those living in poverty. It makes it impossible for people to, of lower incomes to own homes. We are not, you're not seeing capitalism. What you're seeing is a manipulated economy. It is just simply that the people do not understand the extent of the manipulation. John, thank you for joining us this evening. Do you have a final message for us? Yes, absolutely. I think that the United States is still the strongest and the best country in the world. It was founded on the concept of freedoms, freedom of religion, speech. The founding fathers certainly did not understand anything about modern economics. But there have been people that have taken over the economy. They've taken over what children are allowed to hear in the schools. The minds of the young are now manipulated. They are told what to believe and they're told what to understand. And they're told how to react to situations. They're not taught history. They're not taught what has happened in the past. If you cannot make decisions based on past actions, then you will make many false decisions. It is very sad what is taking place in many areas. You truly cannot understand or believe what you hear in the news today. You see, when I lived, it was very, very difficult economic times. It is quite possible that those times will be repeated. Today you have a huge split in the number of people that are incredibly wealthy, and you have a huge populace of individuals that are living in poverty. If those individuals with great wealth would use that to help the people living in poverty if they would be less inclined to see how much money they can hold in their bank accounts, if they would turn that money back to the public, there would be great aid. You see, the separation of wealth in the country is going to, at some point, bring about a type of revolution. It may be a simple revolution of voters where they understand what is taking place. Or it may spark violence when people can't raise their families. There are many things going on. Population growth has got to be incorporated into a type of government regulation that helps assure that everyone has basic needs assured. Throughout time, when people have not had these basic needs assured, there have been revolutions revol revolutions, uprisings, political actions. Hopefully, there will be enough people in government with the foresight to understand what is required to make a strong foundation for 
everyone to find lives where they can be happy, where they can raise their families, educate them, and where individuals have the opportunity to achieve. When people are kept from education, there will only be drugs, crime. There will only be many problems to be overcome. I tried to point out the problems that humans in the United States were living under during my time. Hopefully, people will still understand that the challenges in which I lived are still pretty much unchecked. So I thank you very much. I thank you for allowing me to come through. Should I be invited again, I would be happy to return. Okay. Thank you, John, for sharing your wisdom with us. More people need to hear that. Our last guest will be Jules Byrne. And... <laughs> okay. Uh, Jules, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you were born in 1828 and died in 1905 and are famous for pioneering science fiction novels. Did you have help seeing the future? Thank you for having me. I would have very vivid dreams. I would see these things. My life, I lived on the water. I loved the water. I would sail in small boats. I would be look up into the sky and I would see the heavens. I would see the stars. I would see many things that I didn't understand. But I would actually see these individuals come to me in my dreams. I would, I would go on adventures in my dreams. Many of the ideas that I wrote of in my book were truly given to me by my guides. Now, I did not understand this at the time until I went home. But I would see these incredible figures. I would think of the possibility of traveling to the moon. I would think of going through the air in balloons. It was my mind was incredibly imaginative. I never really understood that my imagination was a gift of my guides and God. So were you aware that you had psychic abilities? <clears throat> I thought that I, it was quite possible that I did. In those days, a lot of people looked down on people that were said to be psychics, so I kept it to myself. But yes, I understood that I had special abilities. Yeah. <clears throat> so do you think your spirit guides were leading you without your conscious understanding about what was taking place? Oh, absolutely. There's no question that my guides were giving me ideas, that they were telling me to write about things of the future. Yeah. They wanted to try to prepare individuals for thinking in terms of what might be possible. Now, a lot of the things that I wrote about were impossible, but the concepts weren't. So, yes, absolutely my guides were helping me. Where did you get the concept for 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea? People were working on the concept of submarines. They were trying to figure this out. It was very, very dangerous. They had... People were dying all the time. They didn't figure out how they could have oxygen supply underwater, and that was what basically what was holding them back. But the concept of an underwater craft, the more I thought about it, the more I thought about how amazing it would be if you truly had a ship that could do the things that the Nautilus, Nautilus could do in my book. So part of it was my imagination, but a large part of it was my guides helping me to imagine things. 
how did you get the idea for a submarine to run on batteries? Internal combustion engines didn't exist. They were experimenting with electricity, but it was it was a very young science. People didn't even understand the true concept of lightning. Somehow I got the idea that you could you would be able to store electrical energy in batteries. And I put it together that it would be a wonderful place in a vehicle that could travel underwater for power. There was so much that I didn't understand. But there were so many details that were filled in by my imagination. So what do you think when you view our modern navies and their submarines? It's incomprehensible. I watched from this side through the time of development. I watched as the first submarines were experimented with. I watched as people died trying to figure it out. I watched the growth of submarines through both world wars. I realized that it was a great weapon of destruction. That was something that I really had not considered. Today, what is possible is far beyond anything I could have conceived of in life. But I can assure you that there will be amazing things in the future as well. So what did you think when you watched from the other side as the United States' first nuclear submarine was named Nautilus? I was amazed. I I was so happy that people still read my works. In order for my works to live like this, it just exceeded my any expectations. For the fact that they would still use the name of my my vehicle as the first nuclear submarine, I was just overjoyed. In your book, From the Earth to the Moon, you presented Florida as the most logical place to launch a vehicle into space. Yet you were on a French or you were a French author. Cape Canaveral became the launch site for our space program. Where did that prediction come from? I dreamed it. One day, one night I had had this dream that I was out of body and I was traveling in this tropical place. And the thought was put in my mind that it would be a magnificent spot where you didn't have to worry about snow and, and rain to do your research on these projects. So I didn't really want to do the base of what was going to happen in this book in France. So I used this wonderful warm place that I had dreamed about. So that's really how it happened. It was something that, once again, the guides put into my head. You wrote the book Around the World in 80 Days. Our astronauts are in the, in the space station, can, get, can go around the Earth in 90 minutes. What do you see as the future for space travel? Now that I'm over here, I understand much of what is going on around me. The interdimensional relationships of space and time are something that humans have absolutely no concept of. I know what is taking place in current times. I know how unadvanced humans are in their technologies. I understand what is taking place around me on different planets. I understand the concept of how people travel. It is a concept humans have never even thought of as yet. So I can assure you that if humans don't destroy themselves with their weapons of mass destruction, that in the future... 
there will be individuals from other planets that will guide them and help them. And that they will be amazed at what will take place. It will take generations. But people being born today will see things happen far beyond the comprehension of what you are thinking now. You lived in Paris when, in 1848, the French Revolution broke out. How did the French Revolution affect your writings? I tried to stay politically neutral. In the beginning, I thought that the French Revolution was a great thing. I thought that the people would be able to come up with a form of government transition and that everything would be great. Individuals took over the movement. There was great violence. So really, I just simply tried to stay out of the way and not get involved with it. I realized that my writings were far in the future. I slowed up a bit in my in my publishing until I felt it was safer. But I had great hopes for the revolution. You made many amazing predictions. You wrote about skyscrapers, elevators, electric city lights, and even mechanical calculators, as in computers. Where did these predictions come from? I was blessed with incredible help from my spirit guides. I never understood how it was happening. But just as Barry is sitting there speaking my words, I would have these thoughts come into my head. And I, would, I was given very good journalistic and writing skills. And I would decide that I would like to put these into book form. They would basically come to me in dreams. And I would write down after the, when I would get up, I would write down my thoughts. And the only thing I can say, it was truly the act of God. So is it safe to say that you were sent back with a life plan to prepare humans for the future? Absolutely. I never realized it until I returned, but I was sent back to do exactly what I did. I can only thank my for my belief in God that I stayed to my life plan. But my guides were incredibly active and helpful, and I managed to succeed. Our, our guides are wonderful. You had many physical problems during your lifetime. How did these problems affect your writings? I think that it made me more proficient. Since I had these physical problems, I was limited in a lot of the things that I could do. I could sail. Sailing was very comforting to me. I would have great meditations and thoughts when I would be on the water. Physical discomfort really inhibited a lot of my physical activities, so I had much more time to devote to my writings. It was very painful at times. I suffered from diabetes. I would have infections. But I tried to do the best that I could, and I was actually very proficient and prolific in my writings. And a lot of it was because I wasn't capable of doing many of the other activities that I would have been doing. Jules, what do you see as the future for mankind? The future for mankind is obviously in their own hands. What will happen is depending on how mankind decides to act and behave in the future. If they follow the commands of God, love, coexistence, helping one another, the future of mankind is unlimited. If they let hatred and anger take over and destroy mankind with their powerful weapons, then that will be the end. So you see it's totally in their hands. Okay. How long do you think it'll be until we can travel throughout the galaxy? Assuming individuals learn to get along 
and that mankind is allowed to advance, you will, I would, I would say five, six generations, and you will be amazed. Okay, thank you so much, Jules, for joining us this evening. Your messages were very interesting. Uh, do you have a final message for us? Yes. I was incredibly blessed by God that I could see the future. I didn't understand where the ideas were coming from, not until I got back home. But God was giving me the ideas. I was sent back to help prepare humans for the future. My other two friends with me today were sent back to help prepare individuals for the future. That's the purpose of what authors do. Authors are intended to show the weaknesses of the cultures and the civilizations so that they can be corrected. Freedom to write as one pleases is very, very important. Freedom of speech, the freedom to live your life, all of these freedoms are incredibly important. If you do not protect these freedoms, they're going to be taken away from you. Understand history. Know that throughout time, individuals have taken over civilizations. Understand that throughout time, it is only through love, coexistence, and doing what is right the cultures have been able to advance. We all lived at different times. We tried to do our best. I tried to write ideas for the future. Many other authors built upon some of my ideas. It is important that minds be allowed to actively work and to free and to advance with freedoms. So I thank you for allowing me to come through tonight. Should you want me to return, I would be more than happy. Thank you. We just might have to have all three of you back because you were all loaded with good with, ideas. I, good coming. ideas. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Thank you so much for sharing your abilities with us. Okay, next week we're going to speak with the spirits of three famous comedians. George Burns, Lucy Arnez, and Charlie Chaplin. Hopefully we'll brighten things up a bit. So tell your friends it should be an interesting show. You can submit questions or suggestions for future guests through email, channelinghistoryonparaex at gmail.com. Mate's book, Message of God for a Modern World, is now available on Amazon. It's in soft cover, ebook. It's in, there's a Spanish edition, an English edition. It has 60 channeled messages from our Wednesday podcast, a weekly message from Jesus. It's available on Kindle for immediate download. I highly recommend it. The messages are wonderful. Signed copies are only available on my website, barrystrom.com. I hope that you enjoyed the show tonight. I hope that you tell your friends about it, and I hope that you tune in again next week. And I would like to thank you all for joining us this evening. I hope you have a wonderful week. God bless every one of you. Okay, guys, thank you for listening. Please join us Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Parax Radio Network. Thanks for listening to Channeling History. Tune in again next week for another electrifying episode as we never know who will make an appearance or who will come through the portal. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2020. Our story begins by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com. Incompetech.com.